Thanks. Well, good morning, Oasis. Uh, we can do better. Good morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord with you all this morning. Um, obviously, Pastor Lynn is not here, so I'm pulling double duty today. She is doing a college visit with our daughter at Shenandoah University this weekend. And so uh, they're, I think, watching online, which is a little problematic because I'm going to be using her as a sermon illustration this morning. So two things, two things. If she's not watching, number one, tell her how great it went. And number two, do not say anything about the sermon illustration, right? Because that's that helps me. You guys are, you guys are helping me. Um, but we're enjoying this season with Oasis Church, just so you all know. I mean, it has been a, a blessing for us to be here and, and to feel part of the Oasis family and, and to really um, create connection and, and community with you all. And so from the bottom of my heart, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for making us feel welcome. Thank you for making us feel a part. We have been such an a honor to, to be here with you all. Well, this morning, we are in week two of Advent. And some of you might be wondering what Advent is. And kids, if you're wondering, I'm going to help you out. I think it's sadly a tradition that's gone by the wayside in modern church because it's not flashy. It's not trendy, right? You, don't, you can't have a laser light Advent show. It doesn't work. And so it's gone kind of away. But I love history and I love tradition. Anybody else? How many of you guys have family traditions? It has to happen every, every, every year, right? We love traditions. And this is a tradition that I absolutely love. And it's not one that we invented. In fact, it's about 1,500 years old. It goes back to about 500 AD. And up here, you'll see we have five candles and each one represents a different focus for Advent. One, last week, we, we lit the hope candle. Today, we're going to light the love candle and then joy and then peace. And then on Christmas Eve, we light the final candle, which is the Christ candle, which represents light coming into the darkness, light of the world, Jesus coming here. And so what I want to do is I want to invite my friend Braden up to come and, and help me light this candle. Can we welcome him up? Just don't burn it down. That's all we ask. First try, like a pro. Oh, keep going. Two-handed, all right. Not too close, because then it's not actually catching on fire. No, there you go, there you go, you got it. All right, let's give him a hand. Kids, we want you in here as we celebrate Advent. So children, you are dismissed. You can go back to your children's church, back to your classes. Thank you for sitting through this. Brayden, thank you for your help. I'm so appreciative. You did such a great job. Well, we are celebrating each week. We celebrate by lighting a candle. And what it does is it brings us closer to the day. The day where we light the Christ candle. The day where, where we celebrate this thing we call Christmas. Light entering the darkness. And, and we're, this morning, we're continuing our Christmas series titled, Come, Let Us Adore Him. And here's why. Christmas has a way of becoming about all sorts of stuff, doesn't it? About the going, about the traveling. How many of you guys have travel plans already? How many have had sticker shock from plane tickets, right? Like, like it becomes about the doing. It becomes about the, the shopping and then the baking and the cooking and then more shopping and then the wrapping, and then we buy gift bags because who has time to wrap everything, right? And then and it becomes about all this stuff. And, and if we're not careful, it can become about family. Christmas can become about the baking. It can become about finding the perfect gift. Christmas can become about new or old family drama. Christmas can become about all of that, but through the going, through the doing, we can lose focus on the fact that it's really all about Jesus. And sure, we might still go to church every Sunday. And we might sing all the songs. In fact, we might even have our own little Advent set at home, but we miss Jesus entirely because it becomes about all the going, all the doing, all the shopping, all the buying, all the wrapping, that it's no longer about Christ. We miss stopping and just allowing Jesus to consume our focus, which is what it means to adore something. It's not like, oh, look how cute, isn't it adorable? When you adore something, it takes up the entirety of your focus. It takes up the entirety of your thoughts, of your actions. It's something that completely takes away your anything else but focus on, on it. Now in church, we call that worship, right? But it's frustrating because in modern church, when we talk about worship, we talk about worship, right? We start talking about songs that we sing, which absolutely is an aspect of worship. But how many of us know that songs in and of themselves are not worship, right? Music in and of itself is not worship. Yes, we do have songs that are worship, but not all, all music is worship, right? And so we can give and we can fellowship and we can read the word and we can pray and we can, we can you know, 
encourage one another. Those are all acts of worship, right? We need to understand that, that worship is part of who we're supposed to be, not something that we do, right? It's not something that, that happens when the first strum of a chord, it's something we enter into every single day as followers of Jesus. Last week, Pastor Lena talked about the fact that we can't, we can't worship from far away, that we gotta come close. And like the wise men who saw the star, they had to go on a journey to come close so that they could adore the newborn king, right? They could come and worship him. We can't worship from far away. We've got to worship up close. If we intend to allow it to dominate our focus, we have to get in closer proximity of it. Well, this week we're going to talk about our response, which is what worship is. Worship is our response to what God has already done. That is, that is why we worship him. It's the reason we worship, right? And, and like I said, in modern times, we make it about music, and it really isn't, right? Songs, songs aren't all just worship. And there's lots of definitions of worship out there, and I think people mean well and they try. But I think the problem is we, we misunderstand what worship is. Worship comes from an old English word, worth sight. And it means this, the attribution to something because it's worthy, right? So worship is literally us giving something, our attention, our focus, and our praise because it's worth it, right? That's what worship is. It's our response to what we value most. And if you look around in our society, you'll see lights, and you'll see trees, and you'll see songs, and you'll see the word Jesus, and you'll see nativity sets and lawns. You'll see everything pointing to a day, Everything in our society pointing to the day except the people. And that goes for us too. See, it becomes so much about all the things we've got to do. It stops being about the one that did it already. It stops being about what we're supposed to be doing, which is coming and adoring him, allowing him to consume our focus so that we can become more and more like the one we claim to follow, right? It can become about the lights, the presents, the gifts, the wrapping, the baking, the traveling, it can become about candles on Sunday morning. All these things that are meant to point to Jesus, if we're not careful, can take us away from actually interacting with Jesus. He who we say we value the most. And listen, I don't, I don't want to step on anyone's toes, but it's kind of my spiritual gift. You know what I mean? You guys, you guys know what I'm talking about? Listen, I'm going to wade into some uncomfortable waters, all right, for a second. But if you spend more time talking about your politics than you do your God, there's a problem. And if you can defend your political stance better than you can fit, defend your biblical stance, there's a problem. We're probably not worshiping the right things. And I can just tell you this, the world knows that the church is worshiping the right, wrong things right now. Because we have become a political organization, not a spiritual one. See, we don't have a Jesus problem in our world, we have a worship problem in our church. As believers, we have started believing and we started following, started worshiping the wrong things and they're not Jesus and that's a problem. And I don't mean to make anybody upset. I'm not saying your politics are wrong. I'm just saying your politics and your spirituality are not synonymous. I don't care what your politics are. I care that you're moving towards Jesus. I don't care what you believe personally. I care that you're glorifying the King of Kings and you're becoming more and more like him. Well, like I said, I have the gift of stepping on toes. I apologize. Linda can clean that mess up later. See, the problem is as followers, we've let too many other things dominate our focus. The world is supposed to see us and know that we are followers by the way we love. But what the world sees largely when they look at the church is us telling them they're unloved. They're wrong. They don't belong. They don't fit. They may not enter unless they look, act, and sound like us. And can I just tell you, that's wrong. And to do that, this, this, whole, this, whole, this whole rant, by the way, is setting up what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk more about worship. To set the stage, because we're going to talk about what we allow to dominate our focus and how it should impact our lives. The way we see the people on the outside as followers of Jesus. Now, in your mind, this is what I want you to do. I want to put yourself in the middle of a field all by yourself. In the middle of the night. Maybe there's a light or two out in the distance. Maybe a couple sheep running around. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appears. 
and the glory and the radiance of, of, of the Lord surrounds you. Suddenly there's someone else with you. Have you ever felt like you're being watched before, right? This times 10 is what we're talking about, right? Suddenly you are no longer alone. Suddenly you are surrounded, right? But that's not all. Everything around you seems to be glowing. Everything around you seems to be a light, like, like there's something going on. How would you react? Some of us run. Some of us would cower in fear and freeze. You know, the, we're told that the shepherds in the story freeze, that they're terrified, right? And the Bible says the angel appears to these shepherds and says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Now, if you're a note taker, if you write in your Bible, if you write down notes, I want you to take note of something. I want you to underline part of a text. I want you to be that person this morning, all right? The angel says, I bring you. I bring you. Who's he talking to? The shepherds. I bring you, shepherds. I bring you something, right? I'm bringing you, underline that. I'm bringing you, not the king, not the priests, not the, not the religious elite. I'm bringing you the good news that will bring great joy to all people. This is why I want you to take a note of that. And this is why that is such a big deal. Shepherds are not what you'd call the cool kids, okay? In this day and age, in fact, most scholars think they're kind of like untrustworthy outlaws. We make them like these very pious guys. You know, if we always see the shepherd of the nativity scene, they're like, hey, it's me. You know, that's not how it is. These guys would have been considered in Jewish customs ceremonially unclean. This is why they're stepping in all the stuff. You guys know what I'm talking about? They're a, they're a mess. They haven't had a shower in a minute. And I don't know if you've ever been to a farm, ever pet a horse before. I grew up on a farm. And this is what I can tell you about these guys. They didn't just stink, they stank. You know what I mean? Like it was bad. Like these guys are not the people the religious leaders of the day would have spent time with because they would not fit the mold. It would make them look bad. It would make them look like they too were unclean. There's a word for that. It's called sinners. But the angel appears to them. And he says, I bring you, you messy, dirty, outlaw, unclean shepherds. I'm bringing you the message for all of humanity. Now, if you're like me, you might've wondered why in the world would the angel appear to the shepherds, right? Why not the priests? Why not the king? Why not the religious elite? Why the shepherds? I think the reason is, had the angel appeared to anyone else, they would have thought it was something they did to deserve it. They would have thought it was their holiness or their position. Something they did that made the angel show up, right? That their religious piety, their worthiness, right? Let's be honest. When God shows up, we often think it's because we did something right. Isn't that true? When God shows up, how many of you guys have had God answer a prayer and you try praying the exact same way again because maybe he'll do it again? Like he's the genie in the bottle. He's rub him again. He's going to do it again right? And so we treat God this way. If God shows up, we're like, it's something I did. And we do this with religious leaders. Like if God's working through their ministry, we put them on a pedestal and we go, they must be close to Jesus. Listen, God does not show up because we make him show up. And God does not show up because of our worthiness. Listen, this is the truth. God shows up because he chooses to. God shows up because he wants to. We can't force him to. We can't make him show up. We can't make him do what we want him to do. He shows up because he chooses to, because he loves you and he loves me. And that first Christmas, he doesn't reveal his love to us just by the birth of Jesus. He does it through the announcement of the birth of Jesus as well. He shows up to the people who had been relegated to the very, very edge of society. The people not invited to the temple. The people who could never commune with the religious elite. The people who are on the very fringe, considered far away, like many people in our society right now. And God, check it out, God doesn't leave them there. God doesn't leave us there. Christmas is about God coming close. Why? Because we can't worship from far away. And God said, listen, it's okay. You can't worship from far away. I'm going to make it easier. I'm going to come closer. I'm going to bridge this gap so that you can worship me. And the angel tells us how close. He comes as a baby in Bethlehem in a manger. 
which is weird. Because he could have come as a warrior king with an army. He could have come as a priest with a congregation. He could have come with position. But he chose to be born in a manger. And again, suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God, saying glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God has pleased. So the whole sky is filled with angels and they worship. And we don't know how long this went on, but it went on long enough and eventually it stops. And the shepherds kind of look at each other and they go, well, let's go check this thing out. Let's go see if, if what they said is true is really true, right? Like, how, how many of you have ever, like, seen something happen, and if you didn't see it happen, you would never have believed it, right? If you didn't see it happen yourself, there's, like, there's no way. How many of you guys have funny stories like that, where if it didn't happen and you weren't there, you would never have believed that it happened? I'm going to share a Pastor Linda story, okay? So this is where I'm going to get in trouble. So years ago, I used to have a giant fish tank, and I had, an, I had an eel in my fish tank, and I love eels. They're cool animals. But my little fish kept going missing, and I couldn't figure out why. Well, one day I come home from work, and my wife's like, I know what's happening to your little fish. I was like, okay, what's up? She's like, the eel is ambushing him and eating him. And I'm like, well, that's what eels do. I just need to buy bigger fish, right? Like, I just need to get smarter than the eel and get something they can't, they can't swallow. And so she was really ticked off at this eel because she really liked the fish it kept eating. And so we go to bed. I think nothing of it. About 1 in the morning, my wife's in La La Land, or so I think, and she used to, she went through like a phase where she's talked in her sleep. I don't know if you guys have ever done that. But out of nowhere, she yells. And I don't mean she mumbled. And I don't mean she said. I don't mean she talked. She yelled, stop killing my fish, you homewrecker. Now, listen, I'm as confused as you are. Because it's 1 a.m. And I'm like, what? And so I said, Lena? Silence. I said, Lena? She said, Yeah. I said, did you just say, stop killing my fish, you homewrecker? And she said, shut up. And so I just like started laughing. We had a friend staying from out of town. I went and told them. I went and woke them up and told them what happened. The next day at work, I tell everybody. Next day, my friends, the next week, the next month. Listen, it's 17 years later. I'm still telling this story. Why? Because it's freaking ridiculous, right? When we run into stuff and when we have these kind of events, we tell the story, don't we? We will tell it over and over and over again. So here's where we are. The shepherds are no different. They just had this thing happen. These angels appear telling them that something is going on, right? That there's a baby in a manger and he's going to be the Messiah. And the angel said, it's there. And up until this moment, listen, I don't think that they're still convinced. Like maybe it was a hallucination, right? Maybe it was something they ate. Maybe it was some bad pizza, right? Maybe it was aliens. I don't know, right? But they go and they find this manger and they find the child. And they find that everything they were told was confirmed. And the Bible says, after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone. Underline that. Shepherds told everyone what happened and what the angels said to them about this child. After they confirmed it, these men who were far away came close. These men who were on the very edge, who were not invited into God's presence, were now in his presence, and they told everybody what happened. Why? Because they came, and it consumed their thoughts. It consumed their actions. It consumed what they ended up doing. It spilled out in the action. They adored him, and then there was action. It impacted the way they lived. It impacted what they said, what they did. And I think too often, especially during Christmas, it's really easy to go through all the Christian motions to say all the right things and to not really allow the magnitude of Christmas to impact and change us. To not really allow what God did to be something that impacts us so much that we talk about it nonstop that we talk about our experience. Maybe it wasn't out in the middle of a field and suddenly the heavenly host appeared. But we all have our Jesus story where God has showed up and we've seen him at work. But in Christmas time, it becomes about all the doing, all the doing, one more thing to do. We stop talking about Jesus. Everything points to him except us. God came close, not for the elite, not for the king, 
not for the rich, not for the religious. God came close to everyone so that those who are even far away at the very edge of society were able to have a relationship with him and be in his presence. And when the shepherds realize this, they tell everyone. This is news. They can't keep themselves. They, they tell everyone. You know, sometimes in a relationship, it becomes so everyday normal that we forget how big this thing that God did actually is, right? And we may come to church and we may sing and yeah, we worship, but it doesn't spill out into the rest of our lives. You don't start telling other people about Jesus, about what he did, about who he is, about what he's done. See, there's another term for that. It's called praising God, and that's also an act of worship. And we may say, oh, thank God, or God is good, or, you know, I'm blessed. But we do, do we ever really stop and talk and tell people why God is good? Do we ever stop and tell people why we're blessed? Do we ever stop and talk about the goodness of God and what he's done in our life? See, many people celebrate Christmas and miss the point, and I'm not talking about non-Christians. I'm talking about people in church. We celebrate Christmas and we miss the point. We're so consumed by all the other stuff that, that Jesus gets sidelined. But what if we became so consumed by Jesus, all the other stuff became the stuff on the side? What if we made sure everyone came into contact with knew that Jesus was alive and well? See, the message of Jesus is often called the good news. It's called the gospel, right? The good news. And here's the thing. How hard is it to share good news? It's not hard at all, right? When my wife got pregnant with our first kid, I told everybody. People I'd never even met before. I'm having, my wife's having a kid. My wife's having a kid. You couldn't shut me up, right? He started eating food. I have a bajillion pictures of him eating spaghetti. Like he's the only person to ever do it on the planet, right? He's a mess. God help me when I'm a grandparent. Like, I'm just saying like, like, it's, it consumed my focus and everything I did and everything I said was about this good news. The problem is we've kind of boiled Christianity down to good advice. And here's the thing. Advice is something you can take or leave. A life is, uh, advice is me telling you what you're doing and the way you're living isn't quite good enough, right? You know, if you just did this, everything would be a lot better. Christianity is not about good advice. It's about good news. We have the good news of Jesus, and that's easy to share. But man, we break it all down into good advice, and we start telling people what they've done wrong and the way they're living incorrectly and the things that they're thinking that are wrong, which, by the way, listen, if they're not following Jesus, they don't care. They don't care. You can tell them they're wrong all day long. They don't give a rip. How many of you guys ever raised a teenager? You can tell them they're wrong. They don't care. They got to figure it out themselves. They got to have their own Jesus encounter. But what we're supposed to be is people of praise and we're supposed to show them. We're supposed to show them what it looks like to follow after this God and what it looks like to live in this good news, to looks like to live in the freedom that comes with Christ. That's the good news. God came close to those that were far away. But we look at those that are far away and we go, you're really far away. I wish Jesus could do something for you. That's not how it works, church. God came close for them. If it was about us, we wouldn't have needed Jesus. Every one of us were so messed up that if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have relationship. And we get it wrong. Christianity is not about advice. I'm not saying don't share your wisdom, church. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying make sure that you're not just boiling your Christianity down to advice. Telling people why they're wrong the things they're doing wrong, instead of pointing them to the one that has done so much for them. See, Christianity is about God who came close to every one of us that was far away. And when people realize it, they move closer to him and a thing called worship and adoration and praise, nonstop talking about what God has done. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think in this season, I point to Jesus often enough. That's me. I'm up here. I'm preaching the sermon. You know how much I got my hind end kicked this week? Writing all this, going over all this. I don't think I'm doing enough to point people to Jesus because I'm so busy in the doing. I have all the things going on that, man, I think I've got some stuff wrong. I think I need to stop. I think I need to come and adore him. I think I need to get into his presence and just sit and be. 
See, when we come in and adore him, which again means to allow him to dominate our focus and our thoughts, the side effect should be praise. That's the side effect, right? And not just on Sunday morning when it's convenient. I mean, in our everyday lives, whenever possible, wherever possible, we talk about what God has done. That's what the shepherds did. It's what we see in that story. Them praising God, all that he had done for them. He says, what has God done in you? What have you seen him do? What is he up to right now, Larry? How much different would Christmas be this year? How much different would this next year be? How much different would our lives be if we, if we stopped and we thought about how good God has been and instead of talking about all the issues in the world, we start talking about the goodness of our God? How many Christmas drama family things would go to the side if we stopped dispensing advice and we just lived in his goodness? How much differently would this next year be if we became people of praise instead of people of advice? Instead of talking about our political views, what if we talked about the faithfulness of God? What if what we did in this Christmas season pointed everybody who saw us toward the reason? What if every way we think, everything, everything we did, everything we said, every way we lived was pointing to Jesus? And I know that's a tall order. So maybe not everything. Boy, says, what's something you can do? What's one thing? What's one thing you can do to begin to point people towards Jesus in this season? Because it's not about the presents. It's not about the trees. They're all wonderful. It's not about family. It's not about food. It's about light during the darkness and giving humanity hope. That's the message. That's the good news. We're not people of advice. We're people of praise. And we're supposed to be dispensers of that praise everywhere we go. But one place. It's one place. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's your favorite barista. Maybe it's your employees. Maybe it's your family. Where can you start every single day pointing to the reason for Christmas? I want to give you one more challenge. Don't leave this church this morning without practicing praise with each other. Stop someone. Talk about what God has been up to. And if you're not sure what God is up to, because we've all been there, talk about something God's done. People of praise. It changes the direction of our focus. Because listen, Christmas can become all about this when it's supposed to be all about this. It's our opportunity to worship with God. Will you stand on me so we can pray? Lord, the question we all need to be asking is in my life, what is it that I'm pointing to? Lord, in all my going and all my doing and all the things that I have to get done and all the places I've got to go, Lord, what is it that I'm pointing to? Jesus, it's my prayer that we be people who recognize we have the opportunity to point this world toward you. And that we wouldn't take that lightly, but we take that charge seriously. As people of praise, Lord, exalting your name. Not people of good advice, but Lord, people who point to you with every chance we get. So, Lord, as we worship this morning, would you move? Or would you remind us of the things that you've done, what you are doing, and how you will continue to move? Lord, would we as a church come and adore you? We miss you, Jesus, in your name.